Welcome to the Pacific Research Institute's Next Round Podcast. I'm Rowena Ichon, Senior Vice President, and with me is Tim Anaya, Senior Director of Communications. So interesting stuff happening while you were relaxing under the Hawaiian sun, Tim. Aloha, by the way. <laughs> so how was your vacation? It was your first time in Hawaii, right? It was my first time in Hawaii. It was uh, beautiful. It was 79 and sunny every day and um, had a beautiful time at the Royal Hawaiian and we got to see all of the sights and uh, I enjoyed many days on the beach, not paying attention to any work emails. And uh, But work can never escape me because on our one of our tours on the way back to the hotel, the subject of single payer health care came up. So even when I'm thousands of miles away in paradise on vacation, something uh, related to single payer health care always seems to come up. So talk about your, your the top three things that you liked and then and maybe one thing you didn't like. Well, I love the Royal Hawaiian Hotel. I highly recommend that. We're not getting paid. Maybe they could be a sponsor of our <laughs> podcast, but I thought it was beautiful in class and, you know, it was as advertised to me. So I liked that um, very much. Um, I really enjoyed having the opportunity to go on a circle um, island tour. And I highly recommend that because you really get to see, you know, all these things that you've heard about, um, you know, you get to see them up close in person, but you also get to see kind of what life is like across the island. And, you know, the people are very friendly, um, laid back people, um, you know, everybody welcoming, you know, but to get to see the majesty of when you go and see the, the, the blowhole and the beach from, from here to eternity in person. Pictures don't do it justice. You have to see it in person. And when you go to the, the poly lookout and you look all over the area, it's stunningly beautiful to see all these things. You go to the, the Polynesian Cultural Center. It's one of the most beautiful places you could go. You went to the Arizona Memorial. I went to the oh, Arizona yeah. Memorial, but it's interesting to see. And that they, they had the foresight to preserve a lot of this as was. It, it's something that, you know, history is so important. And I think people need to, to, see, to see it for themselves and that you really get to appreciate the, just the, the gravity of that attack. And when you see the size of, of, of the wreckage that's still there, it, it, it's amazing to, to, to think, um, you know, so that that was, um, uh, you know, I, I was pleased we had um, the privilege to see that. A um, couple of interesting things I noted, gas prices, I took a picture, gas prices were only five nineteen a gallon, cheaper than, in, uh, cheaper than in California. And I kept thinking about our podcast interview we did a few years ago, remember, with uh, Kali'i Akina, who is the That's president right. of the, is it the Grassroot Institute? The Grassroot Institute, our, our sister free market think tank in, in Hawaii. And I remember him talking about the Jones Act and all of the issues that they had with not only fuel, but everything being more expensive there. Well, when things are cheaper in Hawaii than they are in the mainland, you know, we're going through um, some real problems right now. So that was fascinating to me to see. The other thing that, of course, is always on our mind coming from California is crime and homelessness. And um, certainly in the um, the Waikiki Beach area, they really keep that clean. You don't see homeless. You see regular police presence. So obviously, they know what side their bread is buttered on. Uh, but when you get a little out, you see, you know, they have the little homeless camps too. But it seems more under control or at least more orderly than, you know, what we see in, in California. It doesn't seem seem a, a, as much of a problem as in California, but maybe it's, you know, something to do with that kind of, you know, island life and that more laid back lifestyle. I remember one of the beaches we went by, you know, had tents everywhere. And your thought is, well, there's a homeless encampment. No, actually, they encourage rent a little camp space and you can be in a tent right off the beach. So very interesting that, you know, kind of all to see all of these issues that we grapple with in California, how they're dealing with them and why. So Tim, you mentioned uh, high gas prices where our colleague, Emily Humpel, wrote a blog on what happened last week with the legislature. They actually gutted the bill that would suspend gas taxes and put in place a bill to tax oil company profits. Unbelievable. 
Well, um, our Wayne Weingarten and I, we have a piece that'll be coming up on Right by the Bay where we kind of go through, you know, what what really is the best way to 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 bring people relief. And of course, all all of these, you know, kind of gas tax relief measures, um, they they all would bring some sort of relief. The question is how quickly and would the people who are suffering benefit from the relief? As Wayne makes the point, really the the the, the way to bring the people the most relief, you know, is to take our our surplus that we have and address California's, you know, nation leading tax rates. Um, that wouldn't provide immediate relief, of course, but that would provide the most long term relief from the high cost of living in California. But it seems to me the little that little stunt means don't expect any time soon that we will see a gas tax holiday or a rebate hitting our mailboxes. Well, it's just it's just insane to me that I guess you know those in the legislature don't understand it that taxes are are part of the cost of doing business and they're factored into the price of any item for sale. So if government taxes something, it raises the price. Now it looks like in this case that the government agency are going to decide uh, how high a profit is too high and, and another agency is going to decide how it's going to be taxed. But as, as you say, you know, we are not going to see gas prices drop anytime soon. And you're already seeing the impact of those gas prices, as you say, and everything else. Uber, you have the fuel surcharges for high fuel prices. You, you will see it. I think you're already seeing it with shipping, um, with delivery services. Those prices are directly passed along to the consumer. Now, some good news as well when you were when you were away. Listeners might remember those woke bills that mandated that a woman and a person from an underrepresented community be on the board of companies in the state. Well, a, a judge out of Los Angeles County Superior Court tossed out the, the racial quota bill um, in summary judgment. You've written a lot about that in Right by the Bay. And the judge ruled, Judge Terry Green, uh, ruled that the law was unconstitutional, violating the state's uh, equal protection clause. I I read in the journal, Wall Street Journal, that only about 300 companies out of the 716 public companies actually complied with the law last year. And so, uh, you know, these companies might have been fined or could have been fined $100,000. But, you know, Tim, it's just in these kinds of laws are just another reason for California companies to uh, leave the state. Well, and people don't realize the importance of having corporate headquarters in California. And so many have left, as we documented in our California migrating study, you know, corporate headquarters being located in California means a significant amount of tax revenue for the state, you know, that we use to fund all the priorities of the people. So when you push mandates like this, only going to drive those headquarters and the tax revenue um, out of state. So let's move on to our guest. Uh, Our guest this week is Murray Sabrin on his new book, Universal Medical Care from Conception to End of Life, The Case for a Single Payer System. Now, Sally Pipes, who is our president, insisted that we have we interview Murray on his book. As most of our listeners know, Sally is one of the fiercest opponents of single payer health care, having grown up in Canada. And and Murray Sabrin's solution in his new book, um, he describes it as a, a single payer individual system of healthcare, which sort of turns the single payer system on its head. Yeah, it's um, interesting. You, he'll, he'll walk you through his plan and how it would work. And it, it certainly would be kind of a radical change in our healthcare in a very different way. Um, really one that re- uh, relies a lot on individual personal responsibility, you know, as far as, you know, leading healthier lives, having better diets, et cetera. So I think you'll all really enjoy, you know, hearing um, about his plan. And while you're listening to him discuss it, you'll think in the back of your heads, what a different vision that is from what is being contemplated here at the Capitol with, you know, bills like the um, single payer bill here in Sacramento. Right. And, you know, if the name sounds familiar to our listeners, uh, Murray Sabre has actually uh, he's done a lot of work on, on financial markets. He's quite a renaissance man. Um, this book is on health care, but he's also a, a prominent libertarian, even ran for governor in the U.S. Senate. So it's a, as Tim says, it's a, it's a fun, lively interview. So here's Murray Sabre. Thanks so much. Welcome to PRI's Next Round podcast, Murray. Thank you very much, Ron. I appreciate being here with you and Tim. 
So you begin your book noting that not very long ago, an individual would visit a doctor to be treated for an illness that couldn't be cured by one of grandma's, quote, recipes. So so fast forward to now, um, we've gradually transitioned to a system where employer-funded healthcare insurance companies are are making healthcare decisions rather than, than patients. And government healthcare programs like Medicare are covering millions of Americans at a pretty significant cost. Set the stage for us. How did we get here where we are with America's healthcare system today? And why did Americans willingly give up control over their healthcare decision making? Oh, that's a great question. It really began, if you want to start the genesis of where, how we got to where we are today, it begins with uh, wage price controls during World War II when employers could not raise wages because of the controls instituted by the uh, Roosevelt administration. And so in order to attract workers, which were in, who were in scarce supply because so many men were off fighting uh, World War II, companies provided uh, employees with a tax-free benefit. In other words, employees got medical insurance that they didn't have to pay taxes on. Instead of getting higher wages for them to go out and get medical insurance, the employer provided that uh, medical insurance uh, policy for them. And uh, we were off to the races where employees really felt that this was an important part of the employment process, getting a a medical insurance policy uh, through their employer. And that is when the whole ball got started. And then since then, more and more benefits have been tacked on to insurance policies through the employer. And people said, well, this is what we want. We want to be protected from the uncertainties of medical care that uh, could befall us. And therefore, uh, the employer is willing to pay for it, which becomes a tax deductible expense for them, but a tax-free expense for the employees. So it was a win-win for employers and employees. And uh, this is where we are to a large degree. But the fascinating thing about that is that in doing the research for uh, books on uh, on medical care, 80, about 80% of large corporations are self-funded, which is kind of fascinating. I didn't realize it was that high, but uh, we can talk about that in a, in a different segment. But again, once you have third parties determining something we should be doing on our own, that's when the distortions kick in, which is um, the overuse of medical care and the uh, the increase in premiums because employers basically were just accepting the premiums that, medical, uh, that insurance companies were uh, offering them. And so here we are in uh, 2022, and the, and the cost of a f- uh, f- policy for four a family of four is around $22,000 a year, which is really an unconscionable number. So you make the case in your book for what you call the individual single payer system, where as you write, every American adult would be in charge of his or her medical coverage. So how different would our healthcare system be um, versus the status quo under an individual single payer system. Share some of the features uh, uh, of this uh, healthcare system as you envision it. Yeah, the way I look at it, uh, Tim, is very simple. Uh, the best way to have medical care provided to individuals is through a process known as direct primary care, where the individual works with a doctor who charges a monthly fee, fairly low monthly fee, and you can go to a direct primary care website and, and see exactly what they are around the country, anywhere from like $75 to $85 a month per person, up to $200, depending on what is covered. And for that, you have access to the doctor 24-7, medical tests are included and other things. So it's, it's almost like concierge medicine, which is basically a, a high-end type of uh, medical care. But with, with direct primary care, that would be the first pillar, if you will, or the first stool of a chair where the individual is in charge of contracting with a doctor for medical care. Then we have already in place the health savings account and other types of accounts like the health reimbursement accounts, the health management account. I, I think we should put those all together in one big health savings account, which allows you to put money in this account tax-free. It's invested tax-free and you can take the money out tax-free. So it's a triple benefit to the individual and that those funds could be used to pay for more expensive um, medical care. And then the third pillar, would be a catastrophic insurance policy with a a, a deductible high enough so you would be responsible for the first thousand, two thousand, five thousand, whatever you feel comfortable with. And that would cover you for all the medical care that you need. And the fourth pillar in my program would be the nonprofit sector, which would provide 
provide medical care to the uh, low income folks. And so we could replace Medicaid, which costs about $800 billion a year uh, off the books. And that would take several years to, to uh, create all these nonprofit uh, health centers around the country. And I helped create one in Bergen County, New Jersey, when I lived in New Jersey. So much of the debate over health care policy today is over two key issues cost and control. Let's focus on both in the context of your plan. What role would insurance play in an individual single payer system? And how would people's out-of-pocket medical costs compare to under your plan? And what are they paying today? Yeah, let me give you an example of this. When I was growing up in New York City in the 1950s and early 60s, um, my parents took me to um, the pediatrician. My younger brother and I would go to the pediatrician occasionally for either a bad sore throat or an earache, whatever the case may be. It was a $5 office visit. There were no co-pays. There was no deductibles, no insurance forms. That was it. It was a fee-for-service situation. And then if we needed a prescription, the doctor would write out a prescription. We would take it to the local pharmacy and uh, my parents would pay for a prescription a few dollars for an antibiotic. Again, no insurance, no forms, nothing. So I grew up in a time in America where it was very easy to get medical care. And then in 1961, my father needed a major operation and he had it done at Lenox Hill Hospital, one of the top hospitals in New York City in 1961. And and it was a blue collar worker and Blue Cross Blue Shield, I believe paid for everything or close to everything because that was the type of policy that was for major medical situations. So we already have had in place a medical care system where the the patient or the consumer of medical care would pay out of pocket and you'd have insurance to cover the big big uh, ticket items, so to speak. And that would be the difference that what we have today with all the co-pays and deductibles and insurance forms. Uh, and so we would get rid of all of that and really have the doctor-patient relationship restored where the doctor would actually be not only a medical practitioner, but an entrepreneur, making sure that patients are taken care of properly and patients would have the ability to choose the doctors, the specialists, and the hospitals they would go to, and the cost would go down because you would need more transparency. So one of the great benefits of your plan is putting individuals back in charge of their healthcare decision makers, not employers or the government or insurance companies. So if individuals are directing healthcare spending, what impact do you think it will have on healthcare spending overall in the system? Will, would people use more or less health care when they know how much it costs and when they have to decide what treatments to buy? I've spoken to so many doctors and other medical professionals over the years in order, in, in order to do my research. And what I came across is story after story where when you have direct payment from the individual to the practitioner, perfect example would be the Surgery Center of Oklahoma, which has all their prices posted online. And this is an example of medical entrepreneurship where prices are a fraction of what you would pay in a hospital. The best example is the first patient that uh, Dr. Keith Smith and his partner had back in 1997 when they opened the center and this woman needed a biopsy for what was uh, possible a breast cancer. And so uh, Dr. Smith called up his uh, colleagues and uh, essentially the whole package to do the anesthesia, the surgery and reading the pathology came to $1,900. And the woman said, that's all because the hospital uh, down the street from your uh, center wanted $19,000 dollars just for the facility. So here's an example where the price of a, a, of a particular procedure could be 90% less if we had direct primary care, so to speak, and these standalone surgery centers without the big bureaucracy of the hospitals where doctors would practice their craft. So to, and uh, patients would be better served by paying out of pocket, or at least having the funds in a health savings account, which they would build up over time. You know, we're always a little bit afraid that we could have a major illness or medical calamity befall us and suddenly we'll be hit with major medical bills overnight. So how would these, uh, those with chronic illnesses or who are diagnosed with say cancer or may need some major surgery uh, fare under your plan, how would they pay today compared to what they would pay in an individual single payer system? Yeah, the uh, what I think could happen, which would really lower cost is there are two things here. As one doctor who has a, a, a major direct primary care operation called Forward, and he realized that what we have in America is not healthcare, but sick care. We go to the doctor when we're sick. And the philosophy of that organization is to individuals to get baseline testing for their blood, for their uh 
whatever else they need, the doctors need in order to determine what is the health status of the patient. And from that, they can help the patient either lose weight, control their diabetes, control their blood pressure. And so what we need to be proactive in order to make sure that people don't have chronic illnesses in the future. And that could start early on in life when uh, by eating right, of course, is an important component of uh, uh, not having a chronic illness. And I think if people are educated about what foods to eat or not to eat and realize that the foods that we're eating, the highly processed foods is a major contributor to illness in this country, I think we'd be on our way to reduce medical care costs dramatically. But in the meantime, it's, it's those catastrophic policies that I think are critical to deal with these chronic conditions. And as I pointed out uh, previously, it's the health savings account, which puts people in charge of their own resources to pay for medical care, which they can shop around for. And, and we have to stop thinking of medical care as some sort of out of the market process. No, medical care is part of the market process and all the benefits of market relationships, supply, demand, pricing, voluntary exchange, I think are critical to having a vibrant, robust, and low-cost, high-quality medical care system. So you write a lot in your book about government social programs to aid the poor. You know, today we have Medicare and Medicaid to pay for health care for the elderly and the poor. You make the case that private charity should take a much bigger role than government and helping those who can't afford afford care. So how would those who are or poor or who, who don't have a job be able to afford or retain health care services under your plan? This, I think, is one of the most exciting parts of my uh, of my plan. And the chapter in my book is about uh, the volunteers in medicine model that was founded in uh, 1994 at Hilton Head, uh, South Carolina, where uh, doctors saw that there are a lot of the low-income workers on the island didn't have uh, access to medical care. So he got together with his fellow uh, retired and they went to the legislature to get some sort of legislation that would uh, indemnify uh, them for uh, malpractice. Now we have that at the federal level. And so that there was born an idea that, that has a long history in America through the mutual aid societies, which then became the nonprofit organizations, to deal with problems at the local level. And that's really, I think, one of the keys here. Instead of having this top-down approach with Medicaid and Medicare, let's do this at the local level where people get to know each other, and therefore they can treat illnesses and treat people in a very humane, compassionate way. So the nonprofit sector, I helped create one in Bergen County, the Bergen Volunteer Medical Initiative. They are saving lives at no cost to the taxpayer. They're providing high quality medical care with all the volunteer doctors, the paid staff. And this is this is the quintessential Americanism of using volunteers and local donations in order to solve an issue, which is access to quality medical care for uh, low income folks. And it works beautifully. There are over a hundred around the country. I'd love to see several thousand. And this is my challenge challenge to uh, Bill Gates and Warren Buffett and Michael Bloomberg, the multi-billionaires in this country and others, if they really want to do something great for the American people, especially low-income folks, they would contact volunteers in medicine and provide the resources to build out these uh, nonprofit health centers all across the country. Murray, America's healthcare system is incredibly complicated to say the least. So a massive overhaul of the system, whether it be Bernie Sanders' view of government healthcare system or your proposed pre-market healthcare system would be absolutely necessary to uh, make any change. How would you envision the transition would work between today's status quo and the individual single-payer system? Well, th- this is the greatest challenge I think we're facing because healthcare costs in this country or medical care costs, like as I prefer to call them, I think will we'll, uh, we'll be four trillion dollars uh, was four trillion dollars in 2021. That is larger than most GDPs of country. I think it would be the fifth largest GDP of the country, the medical care system we have in the United States. So if we could bring down costs by 50%, that would free up $2 trillion. So my mission, now that I'm retired, is to talk about these issues. And I really appreciate um, PRI giving me the opportunity to do so, to reach an audience, to let them know there's an alternative to the present system that would be cost-effective, highly with great outcomes, that would give people transparency, competition, and choice. All the things that I think conservatives would like to see, great outcomes that the uh, left would like to see, and at at no cost to the taxpayer, because we would transition from the current system to volunteer nonprofit centers, so we wouldn't need Medicaid. And Medicare would 
have to be transitioned over a long period of time because you still have seniors that are dependent upon it. But we can get young people off of that by uh, eliminating their Medicare uh, taxes and their that of their employers so they could put money to a health savings account and, and become medical care consumers as opposed to dependent upon their employer for medical insurance. So one of the cornerstones of your book is the importance of personal responsibility in healthcare decision making. So if individuals are, are rightly going to be making their own healthcare decisions again, then it follows that they need to exercise some self-control over what they indulge to avoid costly medical bills. Well, we know America is a pretty indulgent country. Yeah. You know, we routinely rank as as, as one of the most uh, obese countries in the world, for example. So how realistic do you think this will be to achieve? You know, will higher uh, medical bills that could result really cause people to drink and eat less and exercise more? And, and, and how do you envision an individual uh, single-payer healthcare system would entice Americans to lead more healthy lives? This, this, I think, uh, Tim, is really the key to the whole uh, paradox, if you will. We're spending so much on health care and we have terrible outcomes in this country. I mean, it's just unbelievable. The obesity level is at about 40 percent for adults and it's projected to be 50 percent by 2030. And I just finished reading a wonderful book on macular degeneration because my wife was just diagnosed with it. And so the book points out, written by an ophthalmologist, uh, Chris Nobby, K-N-O-B-B-E. His website is cureamd.org. And in it, at the last chapter, it's a 1300 footnote book with all the scientific evidence to, that points out that macular degeneration is basically diet related. And he get, and in, the, in the last chapter of the book, he points out the foods to avoid like the plague because they cause all sorts of problems in your, not only your eye, but the rest of your body and the foods to eat in order to maintain optimal health. So I read this book. We did a, we've done a lot of it previously to reading this book, but we got rid of a lot of things that we still were eating uh, in order for my wife to get back to uh, better health with her uh, eye problem. And we need to have people around the country learn about what they should eat and what they should not eat. And the, the problem that uh, Navi points out in his book is that the reason we have so much macular degeneration and other diseases and illnesses in this country is because our food, instead of being natural, has become processed over the last 75, 80 years. And he believes his hypothesis is that these processed foods are the cause of inflammation in the body, which leads to all sorts of illnesses. So I try to get the message out. I will continue to do so. I think it's critical that the American people realize that health is their responsibility and not the government's. And in my book on universal medical care, I have a chapter devoted to wellness. And the evidence is overwhelming that what we eat is the primary determinant of what our health will be over the long term. And I think I can't stress enough how important this is for the American people to really be educated about what types of foods to eat or not to eat. Maria, as, as we turn the corner on COVID-19, we're scrutinizing the actions of government officials during the height of the pandemic. Many are now realizing that this top-down decision-making process, although they were well-intentioned, were full, really full of mistakes. In your book, you make the case that if your model had been the American healthcare system back in 20, in March of 2020, we would have addressed the pandemic in a, in a more effective and, and less intrusive way. Paint the picture for our listeners. How would a, a free market healthcare system better address a global pandemic? Yeah, this, this, this I think, is one of the most important issues on, quote, public health, because um, health is an individual phenomenon. There's no such thing as public health, there's individual health. So if we focus on the individual as the, uh, as the person that's responsible, for the health decisions or medical decisions with their uh, primary care doctor, then people have to realize that th this illness mainly is an illness of the elderly with comorbidities, the obese. And that's what the data show that if you are elderly, overweight, with comorbidities, you are going to be very vulnerable to this to COVID. And that's what the data show. But uh, I've spoken to people who had COVID, different age groups. Most of them had very mild cases of it. It was like a bad flu. They were run down for a while. They got appropriate medication. But I think with all these people dying from COVID, uh, it just shows you that the medical profession really didn't have a good handle on this illness. And uh, we need to build up our immune system. That I think is one of the keys that uh, a longtime friend who's a naturopath has pointed out in a, in a webinar I, I uh, hosted uh, two years ago. He said, here are all the supplements you need to build up your immune system, the vitamin D, the zinc, the cordyceps, the cortisone, all these wonderful things that are out there that are fairly inexpensive that will protect us from illnesses. And this is why doctors need to be more 
tune to nutrition as opposed to just filling out prescriptions. So finally, for, for our last question, I think we might violate the premise of question number eight about indulging here. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, we call our podcast next round because of PRI's proximity to wine country and our love of discussing public policy while enjoying a great glass of wine. So what wine or beer or cocktail or non-alcoholic beverage are you enjoying these days to celebrate the publication of your terrific book? That's a great question. Uh, as a youngster, I love this time of year because it was Passover. And in Passover, you drink the wine. You drink the Manischewitz wine, which I love, the Concord grape wine. That was a big favorite of mine growing up. And uh, it, I think it, it, it uh, was a wonderful time of the year. And uh, because I have a little bit of a, a digestive problem, I can't drink as much wine as I love. I love white uh, Ziffen, Ziffendel wine. I think to me, that's a great wine. I'm not a big wine connoisseur, but uh, lately I've been drinking a lot of keto coffee, very healthy for you, herbal teas, uh, pH water, things that I think will uh, optimize my health because the last thing I want in, at the age I've reached is I don't want to be pushing uh, popping pills. Uh, one of the sad things I saw in my life was in the last years of my parents' lives, they had a, uh, a cabinet in their kitchen full of medication and they're both cancer survivors and they had all this medication. And I said to myself, I really don't want to be in that situation. I just want to do what I can to make sure that my wife and I are stay in optimal health. And uh, hydrating is one of the most important things in life. Uh, wa cl good, clean water. We have a, a special water filter that we use uh, to have uh, good, clean water throughout the day. But uh, herbal tea is another wonderful thing that people should be drinking. And wine is good. My father lived at the age of 87, given that um, he was a cancer survivor. And one of the things I remember him doing every night when I was a youngster before dinner was to have a shot of vodka. And I think that kept him in good shape for many, many years. Thanks so much, Murray. Great interview. Thank you, Rowan. I appreciate it. Thank you, Tim. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. And when you're on these platforms, don't forget to give us a big five stars. If you don't subscribe to any of these, you can still listen on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash Pacific Research One. That's the number one. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. Hope you'll come back again for next round with PRI.